All right, welcome back. Today we're continuing our review of our third BCBA exam. We're going through the next 10 questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. We also offer a membership now, which will give you access to our Discord, where we can chat about the test, tips, help, anything of that nature. If you're looking for this exam, plus our other two, please check out bcbastudy.com. We also offer a fifth edition task list study guide and our combo pack, which includes everything. Questions, comments, let us know. As always, work hard, study hard. Let's get into it. All right, question one today. Which of the following examples best demonstrates a mand? Remember, what do we want to know for the exam? We want to know what evokes a verbal operant, what reinforces a verbal operant, and then is there point to point and is there formal similarity? So a mand. A mand is the easiest and the most obvious, I think, because it's always going to be evoked by a motivating operation, meaning some sort of nonverbal motivating operation is what evokes a mand. So we're looking for the situation where the mand occurs spontaneously with no outside stimuli, outside verbal stimuli. So A, you approach the counter, say hi. The barista says, what can I get you? You say, I want a coffee, please. Why is this not the mand we're looking for? Well, you saying, I want a coffee, please, is in response to what? It's in response to the barista asking, what can I get you? Therefore, since it doesn't have point to point, but it has formal similarity, it's actually going to be an interverbal. Remember, the man is the result of the MO, not the verbal SD. B, you're running by the beach and you yell out seagull. This would be a tact, the nonverbal SD, followed by the label, tact. C, you walk up to the counter and say, I would like a coffee. Okay, what is evoking this? Well, it's going to be that MO, the establishing operation, the evocative effect of wanting a coffee. You walk up, you see the SD, you say, I want a coffee, evoked by a MO. C is going to be our man. It's just a request. And then D, your mom asks you, what do you want for dinner? And you say, what do you want for dinner? In a coic form of similarity, point to point. So our answer here is going to be C. Again, this is why you need to know, again, what evokes, what reinforces. Does it have point to point? Does it have formal similarity? That's how you're going to figure out the verbal operant questions on the actual BCBA exam. Two, Jim is sitting at his desk across from Dwight. Jim rings a small bell and then offers Dwight an Altoid, which causes Dwight's mouth to dry up. Jim does this every day for two weeks. Now when Jim rings the bell, Dwight's mouth dries up. What is the condition stimulus in this example? This is the example I always use to help me remember respondent conditioning. I think it's an excellent scene for that. When Jim is at his desk and he plays the little chime on his computer, offers Dwight an Altoid, eventually Dwight's mouth dries up at the sound of the computer. Great example. So the question, what does the question want to know? The question wants to know what is the conditioned stimulus? Remember, when we're dealing with respondent conditioning, we can have an unconditioned stimulus and an unconditioned reflex. Then we can take that unconditioned stimulus, pair it with a neutral to create a conditioned stimulus. That conditioned stimulus is therefore going to evoke a conditioned reflex. So we are looking for the conditioned stimulus. Well, let's break it down. Jim rings the small bell and then offers Dwight, Dwight an Altoid. Initially, the small bell is what? Small bell is the neutral stimulus. The Altoid is the unconditioned stimulus, which causes Dwight's mouth to dry up, which is the unconditioned reflex. As they get paired, Jim does this every day for two weeks. Now when Jim rings the bell, Dwight's mouth, mouth dries up. So Jim ringing the bell is now what? The conditioned stimulus through pairing, mouth drying up is the conditioned response. So we know ringing the bell is going to be our conditioned stimulus. We look at A, small bell. The Altoid is the unconditioned stimulus. Sitting at the desk is nothing in this case. Dwight's mouth drying up, depending on what the situation is, could be the unconditioned reflex or the conditioned. If Jim rings the bell and Dwight's mouth dries up, we're looking at a conditioned reflex. But the question is asking about the conditioned stimulus, which is ringing the bell once it's paired with the Altoid. Dave asks his wife what her favorite color is and then what her favorite animal is. And then he asks his wife to get him a glass of water. Dave is using what? Dave is using a little ABA on his wife to get her to get him a drink of water. We might have all been guilty of this at one time or another. But what kind of procedure is he using? 
Well, what is he doing? He asks her favorite color. Pretty easy. Then her favorite animal. Pretty easy. And then, hey, can you get up off the couch and get me a glass of water? Easy, SD, easy question. Easy, SD, easy question, followed by a less preferred, more difficult response. What are we doing? Is Dave building behavioral momentum? Absolutely, right? Favorite color, favorite animal, give me a glass of water. Is this the high probability request sequence? It is, right? The high P, low P, high, high P request sequence, whatever you want to call it. We're going from a lot of high probability responses to a low probability response. Dave's wife saying her favorite color, easy, high probability. Favorite animal, high probability. Getting glass of water, much lower, but we're building behavioral momentum through a high P sequence. C, the pre map principle. What does the pre map principle say? Pre map principle, grandma's law, says we are using the opportunity to engage in an activity or response as reinforcement for a low probability behavior. Not what we're looking for. Don't confuse high P and pre-MAC. They're two different things. So Dave is using what? He's using both behavioral momentum and the high P request sequence. So A and B. Which of the following represents point-to-point -point correspondence? All right. Another verbal operant question. Remember, we want to always, always, always read all four of our answer choices, especially questions like this, okay, where... The question is kind of vague, and you really have to analyze what you're looking for. So point to point means what? It means whatever the speaker says or writes or signs, the listener says or writes or signs the exact same thing. Not necessarily the same form, but what the speaker says and what the listener says are exactly the same. There's point to point correspondence. If I say yellow, and you say yellow, that is point to point. If I say walk the dog, and you write walk the dog, that is point to point. They're exactly the same, okay? So which of the following represents point to point? You see a green light and say go. Not point to point, it's just maybe you tact, maybe you're tacting the green light, right? But there's no point to point, okay? Because there's nothing point to point with the word go. It's green light and then go. No point to point. Someone says, go over there, and you say, over there. Closer, okay, if there wasn't a better answer, maybe this would be it. It's still not exactly point to point because we're missing the word go. A, a red sign that says, no trespassing, and you say, no trespassing. Okay, you read the sign that says, no trespassing, you say, no trespassing. Do we have point to point? We do because the speaker and the listener, or in this case, the sign and the list and the speaker are exactly the same. No trespassing, no trespassing. This is point to point, exact point to point. D, you walk outside, look up and say stars. Again, just tacting some stars, right? We're not actually point to point with anything, okay? Point to point and formal similarity give people so much trouble. You really, really want to study it and understand it. Once you grasp it, it's very simple. All right. But don't miss questions on the exam over something easy because at first it can be hard to grasp. So again, C, you read a sign that says no trespassing and you say no trespassing. These both have are exactly identical, right? The responses, therefore, they are point to point correspondence. Using a behavior chain, Hank learned to mow the lawn. Today, his dad only put half a tank of gas in the lawnmower so that Hank would have to ask for more gas. What type of strategy is this? So the, what is the dead giveaway, right? Because we're asking about a strategy, and it's going to be a chaining strategy because we're using a behavior chain. So what is the dead giveaway here? Well, we already know Hank learned to mow the lawn. Okay, So we're not necessarily asking about the specific chain. We're asking about now dad's behavior of interrupting the chain, right? Instead of going through the same chain over and over again, let's say you walk outside, check the lawnmower for a full tank, get on the lawnmower, turn it on, mow your grass. Now today it's walk outside, check the lawnmower for a full tank, notice there's not enough gas, have to find gas, pour gas in, fill tank. We've added a whole lot of novel responses to an already known behavior chain. And the idea behind this intervention is exactly that. We want 
to engage in novel responses in case the chain breaks. Because we know in the natural environment, behavior chains can be quite messy. So again, dad only put half a tank in the gas lawnmower so that Hank would have to ask for more gas. That is intentionally interrupting the chain to evoke a different behavior. What type of strategy? Is it forward or backward? No, Hank already knows the chain, okay? He knows how to mow the lawn. What dad is doing is a behavior chain interruption strategy. He's intentionally interrupting and disrupting the chain in order to evoke this new behavior. It's something we don't do enough. We get very rote in teaching of chains. We need to be sure to model the natural environment as much as possible, okay? When you're making food, you might forget an ingredient or have to go back to the refrigerator or have to chop something again. There's so many variables that we have to account for. And that's what dad is doing. Okay. He's intentionally interrupting the chain to evoke a new behavior. What type of strategy? PCIS or a behavior chain interruption strategy. Gina's parents really want to get involved with her treatment. They ask to be trained on a DRI procedure. You spend two hours training DRI with the parents and they demonstrate the ability to implement the procedure over the next week. However, when you come back two weeks later, they're implementing a DRA procedure. What explains this? Okay, what is the question asking? It's asking about why the parents are now implementing a DRA when for a week they were consistently showing you they could implement a DRI. So why might that happen? Well, we know they want to get involved, which is great. They asked to be trained, which is great. You train them for two hours. You did your training. They demonstrate they can do it over the next week. So pretty consistently showing competence in this intervention. However, you don't see them for two weeks. And when you come back, now it's a totally different intervention. What do we call this? A, the parents were not trained properly. Well, not necessarily. They were able to do it for a week, right? And they competently. So it seems like the training was effective, at least for the time being. B, treatment drift. Yes, as time goes by, treatment tends to change unintentionally. You want a DRI, they do a DRA. I want positive reinforcement, I get negative punishment. Treatment drift is natural. It's up to us as BCBAs to provide great supervision and make sure treatment drift doesn't happen. Okay, So treatment drift looks like the likely answer. Let's read them all. C, observer drift. Observer drift is more what we're seeing, observing, and measuring. Not exactly what's happening here. Okay, We're just changing the treatment on accident. And then reactivity. Why is it not reactivity? Well, because for a week, they were able to demonstrate through training that they could do it. They demonstrated to you, right? When you come back two weeks later, they're already implementing the DRA procedure. Okay, they've been doing so for however long, okay? So it's not necessarily reactivity because they've already shown they could do it with you, okay? So what really, what really explains this most likely, right, is going to be treatment drift. They've just slowly over time, their behavior has changed. The treatment has changed. What we need to do, get back to training again, get back to the regularly scheduled behavior plan and correct it. No big deal. Just when you notice it, we have to point it out. We have to correct it. Treatment drift, observer drift, going to happen. Natural. It's expected. We just have to correct it. Attack does not possess which of the following characteristics. Another verbal operant. Hitting them hard today. Okay, because they're important to know. So what is attacked? Attacked is a label evoked by a non-verbal SD, typically reinforced by a generalized condition reinforcer. No point to point or form of similarity because it's evoked by a non-verbal SD, right? So it's something in the environment. So attack does not possess. So something attack does not have is what? Which of the following characteristics does not describe attacked? A, evoked by a nonverbal SD. Describes attack very well. That's what attack is evoked by. B, evoked by a verbal SD. No, a pure attack is not evoked by a verbal SD. Me saying to a learner, what's that? And the learner telling me, cat, not attacked. All right, the ninja verbal. Attack is evoked by a nonverbal SD. Read all your answer choices. C, reinforced by a generalized condition reinforcer. That is true. D, labeling the, envi labeling the environment. That is also true. So attack does not possess which of the following characteristics. It's going to be B, evoked by a verbal SD. Attacks are evoked by nonverbal SDs.
Which of the following examples best demonstrates errorless prompting? Errorless prompting, some people struggle with this thought or this idea, but errorless prompting literally means no errors. We are preventing errors from occurring. Errors tend to lead to more errors in teaching. You're working with young clients, working with impacted clients, teaching new skills. We want to teach skills in a way that limits errors to further down the line. Those errors don't become part of the chain. So what best demonstrates errorless prompting? So we're looking for the one where we are demonstrating errorless prompting, the best meaning preventing mistakes from happening. A, provide hand-over-hand -hand physical prompting up until the response and then let the client independently complete the response. Just because you did some graduated guidance, some hand-over-hand -hand up until the response doesn't mean they still can't choose the wrong answer. Okay, so A is not best. Let's see if we can get a better one. B, if you're using three stimuli cards, place stimuli that you wanted selected closer to the client. That's fine, a good prompt. Still doesn't prevent them from making an error. C, ask your client to say their answer out loud before writing the answer on their homework. Okay, why is this errorless? Well, if your client says the answer out loud to you before writing the answer on their homework, you can correct them. So they can, you can work with them and correct them until they say the correct answer out loud, and only then will they write it on their homework. You're not going to let them get it wrong on the homework. This is true errorless. D, ask your client to do the dishes and point at the dishwasher. That's just a gestural prompt. They can easily make a mistake here. The one that's going to prevent errors the most is going to be asking them their answer, getting their answer, correcting their answer before anybody or anybody or they ever write it on the homework, right? So you're not going to let them get it wrong. And that's the whole idea behind errorless prompting. The following is an example of an extinction burst. Okay, what is an extinction burst? Extinction burst is a predictable temporary increase in frequency or magnitude of a behavior, possibly also aggression, when a behavior is put on extinction. Easy as that. So what do we expect in an extinction burst? We expect a behavior to increase, peak, and then decrease. So we're looking for an example of that. A, you work from home, so the first thing you do in the morning is turn on your computer. Today, when you hit the power button, nothing happens. All right, so you hit the power button, nothing happens. Your behavior's on extinction, but does anything else happen after that? Not that we're aware of. There's no extinction burst. There's extinction, but no extinction burst. B, two brothers are fighting in the living room over an Xbox controller. Their mom takes the controller, and both boys burst into tears. The boys bursting into tears are just a either a consequence of mom taking the controller or a response to mom taking the controller, but it's not necessarily an extinction burst. Mom is removing something, so it looks like negative punishment, not an extinction burst. You go to open your garage, but when you hit the button, nothing happens. You hit the button harder several times. All right, here we go. Response, open the garage. Hit the, or hit the button is the response. Nothing happens. Your behavior is on extinction, so what do you do? Your behavior increases in intensity and frequency. You hit the button harder several times. This is an extinction burst in response to extinction. Okay. And then D, John hasn't said a cuss word in almost three months, but yesterday he said five in the span of 30 minutes. What do we call it when a behavior suddenly reemerges after being extinguished? Call it a spontaneous recovery. Not what we're asking about, asking about extinction burst. So we're looking at C. You go to open your garage. When you hit the button, nothing happens. You hit the button harder several times. And then finally, last one for today, which of the following graphs or charts display frequency of change over time? And this is just kind of a rote question, just so you know or you're aware, right? In precision teaching, we're focused on fluency and rate, okay? So if we're going to get a graph or chart that displays frequency of change over time, what are we looking at? Line graph. Line graph does not display frequency of change over time. It might display frequency, okay? But a standard acceleration chart is what's going to display this frequency of change over time. Not a scatter plot, not a bar graph, not a line graph. All right. Thanks for watching. New video or next video coming soon. Be sure to check out bcbastudy.com. Like, subscribe, join. Questions, comments, let us know. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.